There's been a brazen rash of organized looting in California in recent days. Gangs of thieves in ski masks swarming luxury shopping areas, smashing into stores with hammers and crowbars, loading up and taking off. Last weekend, at least four major hits. Friday, thieves targeted a Louis Vuitton, Burberry, Bloomingdale's, and other stores in San Francisco's Union Square. The next night, a mob of about 80 people ransacked a Nordstrom department store east of San Francisco. They took off with the goods in a fleet of getaway cars. Sunday, a swarm smashed into a jewelry store south of Oakland. Then about 20 people hit another Nordstrom in Los Angeles. Mass retail theft isn't new. It's forced Walgreens to close 10 stores in the San Francisco Bay Area in the last two years, and now it plans to close another five. A company spokesperson told SFGate that chain spends 46 times more on security in San Francisco compared to the chain average. So what is going on? With us to make sense of some of what is happening, and more importantly, why, is Wilfred Riley, a professor of political science at Kentucky State University and an author of Hate Crime Hoax and Taboo, 10 Facts You Can't Talk About. Well, welcome. Yeah, great, great to be on the show. So, yes, what I want to hear from you is why is this happening in your mind? Well, I think this is a direct result. I mean, this is a direct case of policy impacting results you see on the ground, speaking as both the legal guy and a quantitative researcher. I mean, California, a few years back, I believe 2014, passed uh, what we normally call Prop 47, which essentially reclassified a whole bunch of crimes as misdemeanors rather than felonies. And I mean, this was obviously shoplifting, this was retail theft, this was grand larceny, this was things you wouldn't expect, like forgery. And the cutoff or top value was $950 or $1,000 for these crimes. This is pretty substantial theft. And what we've seen as a result of that is people often, we've all looked at the videos online, walking into, say, a Walgreens and walking out with $940 worth of goods. And it, it's very difficult to get a Class B misdemeanor prosecuted in a giant urban area. So very often there's there's no real police attempt to pursue those criminals. And that has, in my opinion, escalated to what we're seeing now, which is groups of people each coming right up to this limit, looting luxury stores and so on down the line. So policy has results on the ground. If the police stop half as many people, say, we saw that following George Floyd, we saw that under COVID, you're going to see more crime. So what's the mentality behind passing something like Prop 47? Because, you know, the way you describe it, it doesn't sound like a very good idea with predictable results. So what's the mentality behind it? I think that there, there's a great book by Tom Sowell, who everyone should read, called The Vision of the Anointed, where he makes the argument that in society there's kind of a divide between almost cynical middle class members of society cops and farmers and local doctors who tend to think in sort of common sense terms and perhaps overly educated, generally coastal elites who tend to think in idealistic terms. And I find his argument convincing. But essentially, the idea behind policies like this is that one of the reasons for crime is that the system, quote unquote, is seen as unjust. So if you attempt to make it harder to send young men of color to jail for minor crimes, or you provide social work and training as an alternative to prison, you're going to actually see less crime. People are going to trust the system more. People are going to go out and seek jobs. What this ignores is the obvious common sense fact that one of the causes of crime is that some people are bad. There are crimes like domestic violence that occur at very high levels across all social classes, across all races, because human beings are fraud, flawed, predatory apes. So when you make crime less punished, less often punished, whatever the idealistic motivation might have been, you're very often going to see more crime. But there's an argument that that's not the case, that the more people trust the system, the more people like their society, the less crime you'll see. So we often hear talk with this criminal justice reform about stopping the revolving door. What does that mean exactly? Well, the revolving door in criminal justice is the idea, you also hear school to prison pipeline, right? It's the idea that people will very often be caught up, be arrested on some kind of perhaps misdemeanor, low felony criminal charge. They'll go to jail, they'll get out. 
they'll be fairly unemployable. Uh, they'll commit a misdemeanor or a low felony criminal charge. They'll go back to jail. And I think that we all support real alternatives to that. We all support job training programs to some extent, so on down the line. But again, the problem is that in practice, the alternative to the revolving door very often is just leaving the criminal out on the street. That's what we see in reality. Similarly, you can criticize, for example, Mr. Trump's immigration policy as being a bit too harsh, but there has to be an alternative that doesn't just involve releasing illegal migrants into the heartland. And so going back to describing kind of the mentality behind it, the, from what you were saying and from what I've seen, it seems like the idea is that the criminals themselves are victims, and yes. so that's the problem. But what about the actual victims of the crimes that they're perpetrating? How does that factor into the, that view of criminal justice? Well, that's such a good question. I mean, obviously, poverty and the like do impact crime. Again, I don't think anyone denies that. But the reality, when I half-jokingly said some people are bad, uh, th there's a truth to that. I mean, it might be the case that in an upper-class neighborhood, 99 percent of people are not criminals. But it's also the case that in a solid working-class neighborhood, 97 percent of people are not criminals desperation, anger, hunger might motivate the difference between the 1% and the 3%, but you have to do something to protect the 98%, all the grandmothers that just want to be able to sit on their porch. And you're absolutely right that when you let the wolves, quote unquote, back onto the street, it's tough times for the sheep. There are, there are Twitter threads that are terrible to see that just detail all the young girls. Black kids, working class white kids, recent immigrant kids that have been killed in, for example, gang crossfires. And that's a result of those guys, those shooters, not being in jail where they belong. Well, and we also see what just happened in Waukesha. I'll, I'll give a very blunt statement here. I would rather see somewhat elevated rates of incarceration where the guy who just had a quarter kilo of cocaine might be in a little longer than he deserves to be than hyper elevated rates of crime. And that's often what you're talking about. I mean, this guy in Waukesha was a former pimp whose victim, is the word I'll use, had been a 16-year-old girlfriend of his that had been convicted of something like a dozen other fairly serious crimes. As I recall, one was possession of meth. One of the crimes that he had committed was bail jumping, and he was out on bail of $1,000. I mean, so you can argue perhaps for that particular offense that might have seemed reasonable, but the reality is that for nine times out of 10, for the young women in society, for the people that were injured in that parade, it would have been far, far better to have this guy behind bars while the facts of the case were worked out than to have what we actually ended up seeing occur. I, I, I don't think that's disputable. So you want some leniency at the lower end, nonviolent drug offenders maybe, but the simple reality is that the most common thing that both black and white men are in prison for, if I recall correctly, state system, is murder. So if you let those guys out, you're gonna see an increase in murders. This is just two plus two equals four math. There's also seems to be a lack of willingness to actually charge and convict. I was just looking up some stats. Apparently, San Francisco police make arrests of only about 3% of reported thefts. And you can imagine that most thefts aren't going to be reported if, you know, nothing's going to happen if it's under $950. So what's behind this? Is this just lack of police manpower, lack of will to do it, wanting to decriminalize these sorts of crimes? Well, I think I think that terms like structural racism and all this are, are wildly overused. But here we do see the impact of structure. So you have redefined theft essentially as a felony over, let's say, a thousand dollars. Nine fifty is hard to calculate. So that means any theft that would be a felony almost anywhere else that involves less than a thousand dollars worth of expensive goods, the police aren't really going to prosecute. It's probably not going to be reported. So. That, that's how you get a figure like that. Even among those cases that are called in, how many are you going to send a squad to? How many could you make an arrest in? And again, one of my points, uh, I'm by no means hard right on all issues. I'm pretty libertarian on drugs, this kind of thing. But one of my core points is that there has to be order. I mean, growing up in Chicago in the late 1980s, you know, the era of that one movie, Kids, you would see people, for example, walk onto trains and start painting graffiti. And the entire broken windows model of policing, the entire comp stat model of policing was a response to that, the chaos of sort of the new Jack City era that's still legendary today. And it now seems like we're trying, we've forgotten the past and we're almost trying to return to it. We've legalized theft in practice in large cities and there, there's no good light at the end of that tunnel. 
So we're going to have to wrap up, but let me ask you one more thing. Do you think people are awakening to the real quality of life consequences to electing officials, you know, who are making these policies? In New York, an ex-cop was just elected mayor, a Democrat, but certainly, um, you know, a lot harder on crime than his predecessor. Um, we're seeing a lot of reporting about this, you know, crime wave that's hit California and other places. Do you think people are figuring out those connections that you're talking about? 